Quote, As a humanist, someone who reads, teaches, and researches primarily philosophy, but also on the side, novels and poems and plays and movies, I am prepared to come out and admit that I do not know what the value of the humanities is. Close quote. So wrote Agnes Callard, a, profess a professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago, in an opinion piece in the New York Times. This shocking statement comes at a time when others who are working in her field are desperately trying to make the case for the humanities to students and to the broader public. The humanities are facing a precipitous decline in enrollments and the threat of being cut entirely at some universities. Are the humanities valuable subjects? Should we care that fewer and fewer students are going to college to learn history or English literature? And what should we make of common defenses of the humanities and the shocking admission by an accomplished professor that she does not know what their value is? Welcome to New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Sam Weaver. I'm an associate fellow at ARI. And with me today is Ben Baer, a fellow at ARI. Hi, Ben. Hi, Sam. So, so do you want to start by telling us a little bit about what you think of why we should care about this issue? What, what, why is this worth talking about? I think the reason that you and I care, Sam, is, is obvious on, on one level, at least, that we're both ourselves students of the humanities. Uh, you've studied philosophy and literature and history, and I'm primarily a student of philosophy. And so it, it, it does uh, make us wonder what's going on in the universities we spent so much time in. But it's not just this personal angle that we have. I think it, this is, there's a moment in our nation uh, on this subject, and it's in part because people are looking at what's going on on college campuses. And uh, I think it, it, because of the way they intersect with politics. And so they might be wondering, well, who cares about what kind of uh, curriculum is being assigned uh, to students? Well, take a look at the recent controversy about anti-Semitism at universities. We recently did an episode just last week about the congressional hearings that were held where presidents of a bunch of Ivy League institutions were brought up to the Hill and asked whether uh, blatant expressions of anti-Semitism constituted some kind of harassment or intimidation and the university presidents were unwilling to condemn it in no uncertain terms. And what we argued on last week's episode was that this isn't simple hypocrisy on the part of the university presidents. Rather, it was in a way consistent with the dominant ideology that, that is taught and studied uh, and imbibed on university campuses. It was a, it's a dominant a pr a product of the philosophy of egalitarianism uh, because the essence of egalitarianism is that people who have value and ability uh, are to be disparaged and subordinated in favor of those who do not. Uh, hence the unwillingness to come to the defense of the Jews and apply the kinds of standards to defending them as a minority that they would otherwise apply to other uh, oppressed victims in their view. So th this is a case where you see the university ideologies having a real effect on the lives of people who are attending the universities and the wider culture. You see that in all of the rhetoric surrounding uh, the current controversy in the Mideast with, between Israel and Hamas. You see it when leftist activists describe uh, a call for the need for decolonization of the Middle East. That's academic patois that's coming from uh, egalitarian influence university departments and their rhetoric. And you see it in all kinds of other uh, various illiberal so-called woke movements that are having uh, impacts on society's debates about race and sex and class, etc. And so you might be tempted to say, look, this is just a problem with the humanities as such. It's a problem with uh, having students ask radical questions um, in their philosophy classes, in their various ethnic studies questions, et cetera. But part of what we want to talk about today, I think, is, is, that, is, that, right, is that really the right way to conceptualize this? Is, it, is there a problem with the humanities as such, or is it a problem with the way the humanities are taught today? And just as a kind of counterpoint example to that, I mean, consider, for instance, a very different time and a very different, with a very different set of values, uh, the founding of America. The founding fathers were students of history. 
They studied the history of ancient Greece and Rome. They were studies, students of political science. They looked at different foreign polities to try to decide what is the best uh, structure for government in this country. And they were, above all, students of philosophy. So they were students of the humanities. And uh, they studied it at the highest levels, at the, the best universities uh, in the United States and, and in Europe. And this led to the Declaration of Independence to the Constitution. Uh, I don't want to argue it, it created a perfect society. Obviously, it didn't lead to the Emancipation Proclamation. So there were deficiencies in their studies as well, we can, we can argue. But the point is that the humanities curriculum, uh, the ideas and works of art that the leaders of a society study in universities makes a big difference uh, for human life and human liberty. And so I, while I don't think colleges should dump the humanities per se, uh, it may be that they need to dump uh, many of their present humanists. And the people watching today may may want to think about that when deciding, well, who are you going to support with your money and who are you going to, you know, in spite of the fact that they may be your alma mater. So Sam, let's, let's take a look at some of the, the data that we have about the alleged crisis that's happening in the humanities and the, the kinds of facts that humanists are citing um, about the decline of their discipline. Sure. Yeah, this is something that's been written about uh, a fair amount in the last couple of years. Uh, there's been a, an article earlier this year in The New Yorker, uh, as well as one a few months ago in The Washington Post kind of going through this issue. Um, the New Yorker article cites some statistics from uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, they quote or they cite statistics from the Humanities Indicators Project uh, at, that, at that academy. And here's what they said, uh, quote, during the past decade, the study of English and history at the collegiate level has fallen by a full third. Humanities enrollment in the United States has declined overall by 17%. That's according again to the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, and then another, uh, another research center at the National Student Clearinghouse studied the, uh, the change in humanities uh, students seeking four-year degrees uh, in various subjects between 2017 and 2022. And they found that the number of students seeking four-year degrees in English fell by 23% and in history fell by 12% over those five years. So we're looking at in, you know, in a 10-year in a period, a fall of a, a third in English and history, 17% in the overall of the humanities. And in just the last, uh, well, not quite just the last five years, but over a five-year period, quite recently, a fall of 23% for English and 12% for history. So that's quite significant over a fairly short period of time. Um, and also in, in light of this, uh, there's been some schools that have decided to cut a lot of their humanities majors entirely, eliminate departments or eliminate majors. Uh, most recently, West Virginia University voted back in September to cut over 30 of their majors, many of those being majors in the humanities. Um, and some smaller schools have made headlines uh, for doing this as well. Um, so there's definitely a, a shift uh, that you can see in the statistics. Um, and there's worry on the part of a lot of uh, humanists that, you know, th their school is going to be the next one to cut their department or to uh, significantly reduce the number of, of faculty or the number of offerings. Um, and that's, I think, where you get this sense that there's a, there's a crisis in the field. I mean, I personally was witness to a lot of this when I was a university professor of philosophy for a decade and uh, all kinds of ways in which budgets were being cut. And when I was one of the people who might have been cut, and in some cases was cut, it certainly uh, made a difference to me. And it was also sad to see that uh, students wouldn't be able to take my classes. But at the same time, I think while you can see a perspective from which these kinds of data represent a problem, we have to think a little bit more carefully about whether there's a, a different kind of problem here than what the people bemoaning it themselves might say. And if even the way they are reacting to it is itself part of the problem. So put it this way, is the mere fact that there are fewer English majors or the mere fact that there are fewer philosophy majors necessarily a crisis 
or a tragedy? Well, how many exactly should there be? And who can answer that question? We have to answer the question of how many there should be by thinking about, well, to whom and for what are these majors of value? If you think about that question just from the perspective of economics, from free market economics, the, the answer is going to be something like, well, if you have, uh, you, you can only say you've produced too few majors if the price of the the price that the majors can demand on the market for their labor has is going up so that uh, there's more demand than there is supply and vice versa too few uh, sorry too many if they are uh, if the price that they are getting on the market for their labor is going that is going down because there's just an oversupply of them and if you just go by economic uh, standards it you'd, you'd think that there isn't a crisis because it's not like all of these humanities grads that these universities are churning out are the majority of them being able to demand record high salaries and uh, the rest of the country is running around with their heads cut off. Oh my goodness, where are we going to find all the humanities majors that we need? There's, it, it's, it's nothing like that. Um, if anything, it does seem like there are too many because many of them are unemployable with the experience that they have. Now, of course, the counter to this that the defenders of the humanities are going to give is that we shouldn't be using these kinds of free market standards. We shouldn't just be looking at market prices for labor uh, in order to determine the value of the good. And of course, it, it's not the case that the uh, only people who get paid the most are doing something valuable. There are other factors, but there's still the question of to whom and for what. Uh, who needs to have... Uh, humanities majors, and for what purpose? This is a question that I think, as we're going to discover today, as we look at some of the arguments that are given in defense of the humanities, it, this is a question that I think the humanists themselves are not that good at answering. That they, I mean, we would think of humanists, of humanists, especially the philosophers, as the ones we need to be critical and self-critical about the standards that they're relying on. Uh, too often, though, as I think we've seen just by looking at the way they present these stats, it's taken as a kind of self-evident, obvious point that there's a problem when the numbers of students in these majors goes down. That's a crisis in and of itself. We don't we don't need to, you know, maybe we'll find some after the fact rationalization for why it's a problem. But if that's the way they're thinking about it, you might wonder, well, maybe the humanities are too important to be left to the humanists, or at least to the humanists that we have today. Uh, so, Sam, let's 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 talk about some of those arguments that that they've that they've given. And we, you and I, we both read a number of articles uh, from the past few years where one scholar or another was trying to give arguments in defense of the human of the humanities. And what did they have to say? What are some of the major categories? Yeah, so I think there are there are four kind of standard defenses that come up over and over again uh, that we wanted to talk about. Um, the first one is the the humanities teach critical thinking skills that are really important, and so that's why we need the humanities. That's that's the first one. Um, the idea here, the kind of the argument, is that um, studying the humanities, studying literature, philosophy, history, uh, involves doing all sorts of thinking of different types, reading things, analyzing texts, uh, looking at arguments and evaluating their quality, articulating arguments of your own, um, like all of these different mental processes and operations build certain types of critical thinking skills. And these skills are really useful. You can apply them to all sorts of other areas of life. You know, if you go into a career that's not in you know, the humanities, it's, that's not working with the subject matter. You can still use these. You can still use these in business or technology or any sort of other career path. So the idea is, uh, you know, you may not see the value in learning, uh, you know, 17th century French history uh, or reading uh, William Shakespeare uh, and like studying William Shakespeare and writing articles about him. But by doing those sort of things, you will learn these skills that are useful in a whole bunch of other areas and have a lot of practical uh, career value. So this is often a sort of um, argument against the idea that humanities degrees don't provide a great deal of employment value. It's like, well, actually, humanities majors, 
learn these critical thinking skills that make them a real asset to employers. Now about this argument, and I think it's, it's true that if you learn the humanities and study them and do it, do it well and do it in a rigorous way, that you can learn uh, some thinking skills, you can develop your ability to make arguments and analyze things and all, all sorts of things like that. So there's something real that this argument is, is relying on. But I think it's, what's strange about this is that it, it doesn't say anything about why we really need to study the humanities specifically. Uh, if the goal is to learn these critical thinking skills, and the idea is these critical thinking skills are things that we use in all sorts of other contexts, you can use them in all sorts of business and law and all these other things. Uh, it, it, it's a little implausible that we need to learn the humanities specifically and spend all this time uh, in reading his, history and historical texts and uh, analyzing literature and things like that, that, that to develop these critical thinking skills. I, mean, I think there's a question of if, if what we really want is for people to learn critical thinking skills in order to uh, be successful in business, why not just give them classes that involve thinking about issues that come up in business? Uh, so if this is a, an argument that sort of, I think, starts with we want the humanities classes to remain and we want to convince people that there's a practical value. And here's something that's a sort of plausible practical value for them. But it's all focused on this skill that, you, that you're learning that is going to be practical elsewhere and doesn't really say why the humanities themselves are necessary or valuable to learning this skill, why we really need those subjects specifically. Yeah, and, and part of the reason why it's important that the, that that argument fails is because part of the background context for this controversy about the value of the humanities is that, at least in our society, we don't have the same kind of controversy about the value of the sciences and the various STEM fields. And so humanists are often trying to say, here's why all the money shouldn't go into STEM, uh, because it's demonstrated this dramatic economic value, uh, you should put it into the humanities too, because in effect, it can be used for other practical fields, even outside of itself. But if your main rival is STEM, if your main rival is science, and I don't think they should be seen as rivals, but you're not doing a good job selling your, your field when there's a whole lot of critical thinking skills you can learn from studying science as well. And if we're to judge by the critical thinking skills of the art of the of the humanists who are making this argument which i think doesn't work very well well it, it it doesn't speak well in their favor scientists might be doing a better job and it is interesting sam that at least in the last you know few decades the major public many of the med, major public intellectuals who are commenting on the big questions in life and politics and culture are coming from the sciences uh, you know people like steven pinker uh, Richard Dawkins, they're they're not themselves humanists. Now that, that leaves them, I think, with a certain deficiency. But uh, the humanists aren't really stepping up to fill the gap that they need to. There's plenty of critical thinking skills we can get from other fields. So why study the humanities, I think, is a question still not answered. What else do they have to say? So the second common argument that we hear is the argument that we need the humanities because they teach us empathy. They teach us to empathize with other people. Uh, and the argument is that the humanities offer us uh, a window into the lives of other people. We read literature and experience the, the lives of characters who may be very different from us and may have very different experiences that we've never had. We learn about history and we learn about other cultures and we learn about you know, what motivates people, what they, their experiences are. And we get insights into all sorts of different uh, different lives that are unfamiliar to us. And that the idea is that this, by having this experience, it makes us better able to empathize with other people. And this is, people make this argument, they say this is really important and it's something we need the humanities in order to, uh, to you know, to, get, to deliver that value. Um, now, I think this argument, one question I have about it is, well, what, what, what do you take the value of empathy to be? Um, and, and why is that the thing that you're holding up as the goal? And I'm saying that not because I think empathy is a bad thing. I think it, you know, it's something that, that has a real value to it. But I think that this argument often, when you see how people articulate it and what they say about it, it often carries a sort of 
a, a, a relativistic idea behind it, like an idea that we're going to study the perspectives of others, and that's ultimately going to make us less judgmental and recognize that there's at, that, that all sorts of different ways of life, all sorts of different beliefs are are equally valid, and will will become more uh, tolerant of other beliefs and other ways of life. Um, so I I I think that's often what is what is meant and what is intended by this focus on empathy. And I think that's not uh, not the right attitude to have to all sorts of uh, different beliefs and ways of life. I mean, we're, we were just talking about the sort of the way that the humanities are, are uh, approaching things like the, the war in Israel. And I don't think that we should you know, become uh, empathetic with Hamas terrorists in a way that we become tolerant and and recognize their different way of life as as valid and oh they have their reasons like no I think that's completely uh, just a, a morally bankrupt attitude and so if if that's what they're after by this empathy argument I don't think that's right now what what I think there is to this is I would put it more as um, understanding other people you th there is a value I think to um, to studying the humanities and, and learning about the, the lives of other people in that you can get a, a greater sense of the motives that, uh, that drive people, um, the kind of the different reasons why they believe the things that they believe. But I think that sometimes that might lead us to empathize uh, with people, but sometimes the response is not really empathy, but okay, I understand why this evil person does evil things, and that helps me understand how to fight them. Um, so there's something strange about the moral perspective that I think that they're coming at with this argument. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And it's, again, because it's not that there's nothing to the value of empathy, and it's not that the humanities don't play a role in the valuable kind of empathy that there is. But the fact that this is often the argument that these people lead with and treat as a kind of fundamental is revealing and shows that they themselves, I think, need to be better critical thinkers because the fact that they're leading with the idea of, well, it's all about understanding other people. That's the most important thing, I think, shows uh, uncritical reliance on the, the philosophy of altruism. That's connected, I think, to the point you made about relativism. Sam, and you know, we could have a whole ma great many episodes and have had many episodes on the problems of relying on that idea uncritically uh, or relying on it at all when it has real no, uh, really no earthly grounding for it. But uh, the, the, the bigger question I think um, that they don't address here is the fact that it, knowing yourself is an even bigger challenge than knowing other people. When you're trying to understand other people, you at least have the luxury of having some uh, editorial distance in effect from them to be able to scrutinize what they're doing and ask questions about it. It's a lot harder to get that distance from yourself and to ask questions about your own premises and challenge your own assumptions, which is, again, what I've been emphasizing many of these defenders of the humanities don't quite do enough. And there is a role that empathy for others can play in being able to challenge your own premises. So I think this is, for instance, what happened uh, in the age of exploration in, in uh, the history of Europe and in the Enlightenment is uh, European explorers went out around the world. They discovered all kinds of different cultures they'd never heard of before. It started raising questions for them about their own cultures. Like, well, why do we believe what we believe when these people believe something that seems so uh, different and even wrong and crazy to us? Uh, but they all seem to believe this because they all grew up in the same society together. We all grew up in our own society believing the same things. What justifies our reliance on Christianity and, and uh, various traditions from Greece and Rome? And that's when the Enlightenment happened. They started asking questions about the assumptions they'd been taking for granted for such a long time. This is something similar to, uh, to what happened in my own intellectual development. I was raised Catholic. I went to high school. I met people from all kinds of different religions. Uh, I met Jews and Muslims and different Christian sects. And I started realizing, gee, they believe what they believe because their parents raised them to believe it. Maybe I only believe what I believe because my parents raised me to believe it. And that led me to rethink religion as such. So yeah, there's a way in which understanding other people can help you challenge your own premises. But then that's really what the fundamental needs to be. 
the the know thyself imperative. And here again, I think many of the humanists defending the humanities aren't aren't quite doing that enough themselves. Uh, but there's a, at least a few more arguments we should look at. What's the next one, Sam? Yeah, so the next one is the argument uh, about citizenship. It's the idea that we need the humanities in order to have citizens who are informed, thoughtful, civic-minded, uh, and who contribute in a positive way to the, the political life of our society. And this argument often is put as it's especially important in a democratic society to have people who are, who are voting, who are uh, informed and are able to sort of understand and think through the issues and, you know, be good participants in the voting process. And I'd say this argument often incorporates some versions of both the other two arguments that we've talked about so far. That there's often this idea that, okay, the humanities is going to teach us some critical thinking skills that will make us better able to make decisions in the voting booth. And also the empathy argument in that we need to be able to understand and, and empathize with other people in our society and the humanities make us better able to do that. And that will lead us to make better uh, political decisions as well. Um, I think, again, this is one where there's, there's something that's true in it, but there's something wrong about the whole perspective that they're taking as this being a reason why we should uh, regard the humanities as a, as a vital subject. So I think what I think is true about it is the humanities do have things to teach us that will, uh, that can help us think through political issues and know what we're doing when we're uh, voting or supporting a candidate or advocating a policy. Right? And this sort of goes back to Ben, what you said earlier about the founding fathers, that they, they were making really important political decisions. And a lot of what helped inform their decisions was their study in the humanities, that they studied history, they studied different forms of government, they studied philosophy, and that helped them know more about what would be the right thing to do, what would be the right political system to design the right approach to government. And there's something like that, I think, for uh, for ordinary voters, too. It's like if you know more about the history of and different kinds of government and you've thought through political philosophy, um, that that can help you uh, have a better idea of what the implications of a different uh, of different candidates or different policies can be. But treating this as the primary, I think there's there's again, there's something wrong about the, the basic approach that they're taking this. It's, a, it's another one that's that's too focused on what benefit you're providing to other people. I mean, the way that it's put is basically that um, your country needs you or your fellow citizens need you to be a good, a good citizen, a good participant in democracy, and therefore we need you to study the humanities. And it, it's too little, I think, about what, the, what benefit the humanities provide in the life of the individual. Um, it's, it's way too much on how will it affect your country if you're a, a more informed voter um, or a you know more thoughtful person when you're deciding what campaign to support um, and and things like that. Not only that, but there's still there's still the unanswered question of what exactly is a good citizen, and what counts as a good citizen varies according to the basically the political theory, the moral theory that you adopt, which is itself a question for the humanities to determine. So humanities are only a value if the theory of citizenship that they're teaching is a value. And well, what are they teaching today? To the extent that today's student activists are being influenced by uh, woke egalitarianism, it's encouraging them uh, to be the kinds of citizens who go out and celebrate Hamas terrorists as good citizens. And so is, is that the kind of good citizen we want to have coming from the humanities? It seems like what is increasingly coming out of the elite schools of our day. And it's not like they are the only uh, culprits here. Uh, should we instead adopt a, a Christian view of what it means to be a good citizen? And so in that case, we should be taught to be like Mother Teresa or like the uh, the French philosopher Simone Weil, both of whom go out into the world, find all the suffering there is to find, immerse themselves in suffering, never really do anything to change their society or to lessen the degree of suffering, um, but just minister to it. 
Uh, or should it be something like the opposite of both of those approaches, which I think, again, was the, the approach of the founding fathers who uh, exercised leadership uh, to construct a society for the sake of what was, in effect, protecting their own rights. Now, that's something that uh, many scholars today sometimes criticize them for, that they were really just trying to protect their own property rights and their own, their own happiness. Well, yes, uh, and look at what it gave us. So the humanities are valuable for creating new citizens, educating new citizens, but I think only if they themselves are self-critical about uh, the basic standards of what counts for good citizenship. And uh, it's not yet clear to me that today's hum humanists are doing that, uh, or at least doing it well enough. And so uh, is there anything left, Sam? Do they have anything left in their arsenal of arguments? Yeah, so that the next argument uh, comes from people who often who recognize that there are deficiencies in the three arguments we've talked about so far, recognize that those don't really work. And I uh, say, you know, forget about those arguments. They're, they're not valid. They're not, uh, they're not correct. What we really have to do is stop trying to justify the humanities by reference to some sort of uh, practical benefit that they provide by reference to some sort of thing that they will help us learn how to do better uh, some way that they'll improve us as individuals or improve our society. Um, instead, we need to stop trying to justify the humanities and focus on their intrinsic value. And the, this is the idea, the argument that the humanities have an intrinsic value as a subject that um, is what justifies them. There's nothing outside of the humanities that you can point to as uh, they are justified because they lead to this. It's just they are good for their own sake. Uh, they are worth studying because they're worth studying, and you can't go beyond that. Uh, some of the people who hold this view or advocate this view draw on uh, something like Aristotle's view of the best life as a life that is focused on contemplation. And it, Aristotle describes it as contemplation that is, is loved for its own sake, uh, not for the sake of achieving some you know, later goal. Um, so this is I think where where a lot of people end up when they recognize these these arguments that we've talked about previously, they don't really work. They don't really support the teaching of the humanities. Um, but they they feel something, I think, and 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 experience something that the humanities are this really valuable thing in their own lives. They found it to be um, a profound. Uh, you know, moving, enlightening experience to study the humanities. And they, they think like this, there has to be some value to, to that. That has to matter. And I think they end up just saying it's, well, it's just, it's valuable for its own sake. Um, now, I think the problem here is that it is, I think it is true that studying the humanities, uh, at least in, in some, in some ways, at some context can give you um, a really a profound experience of contemplating something, of thinking about something. Um, I think this is especially true when it comes to studying the arts, um, like reading great literature or, or listening to great music and things like that. There can be a really profound moving experience. But I think also that there's something about you know, thinking about philosophy that people, like, people experience and legitimately so as this was really enlightening and really meant a lot to my life. It's something that mattered to me. Um, and I think that some of the people who advance this argument of intrinsic value think even of the, the previous arguments that there's something that's sort of beneath the dignity of the humanities to talk about its critical thinking and its, uh, its uh, empathy. Like, no, there's something more profound here than those things. And, and, we, and that's, that's the thing that, um, that really matters. But, but I think that what just saying that it's, it, they're just intrinsically valuable is a, just a non-answer. It doesn't explain why the humanities are the thing that produce this, this uh, experience that they find so profound, this knowledge that they find so life-changing. Uh, like, why should it be the humanities that, that gives us this experience and gives us this value? Um, and if you are really going to say, well, we can't get under that, we can't explain that, it's just that the humanities have this intrinsic value and it has nothing to do with practical benefits, and they don't even necessarily provide practical benefits. I, I don't think that's a good explanation of why people should study them. I, I think it's, it, it leaves people to think, well, okay, 
This is not going to help me in my life. It might be a, you know, a, a, a interesting experience, but I'm concerned with going to university to like move my life forward towards a goal and, and find things that are, that are beneficial to me. And so in that context, I think this doesn't really answer or explain anything about why, uh, why anyone who's concerned with their life and being successful should, should take the time with the humanities. I mean, there are things in life that I think we rightly regard as, as experiences that are ends in themselves. Uh, consuming a particular work of art, having a certain kind of relationship with someone, a career that you really enjoy. Uh, the question is whether the study of a subject as such can fit into that kind of category. And especially if, that, that's a question that's especially salient when you consider the price that we are paying for it, both as individuals when we're uh, deciding to take, to, you know, to go to a university, and as a society, when it, we're being taxed to support somebody else's uh, humanities education. I used to know a guy uh, as an undergraduate who was a, sort of a nerdy, pretentious guy. And when he would talk about why he took philosophy classes, he said, it's basically a fancy form of entertainment. And he, he was serious about that, but it kind of brought out the absurdity of this particular view. Because if this is your fancy form of entertainment, what justifies spending tens of thousands of dollars a year of perhaps your own money or somebody else's money, even worse, on this fancy entertainment. Um, it's interesting, Sam, that you point out that many of these uh, defenders rely on Aristotle's view here about the alleged intrinsic value of contemplation uh, as an end in itself. And we were reading, for instance, an article from Stanley Fish, the prominent postmodern scholar who does just this with uh, Michael Oakeshott. And it's, it's interesting that they rely on this argument from Aristotle. This is one of Aristotle's worst uh, arguments, one of his worst views. There's understandable reasons why he had it at the time, but it's important to note that, it's th that the view flows from a number of principles in his system, such as, for example, the difference that, that there's a dichotomy between practical and theoretical reason, and practical reason serves higher ends, theoretical reason is contemplation of relates to the contemplation of truth for its own sake uh, by discovering first principles and this set of dichotomies and views of reason of, of aristotle's is, is the same set of principles that he de ultimately derives his defense of slavery from which is to say uh practical men are there to supply the means to the to others ends intellectuals are the ends in themselves and the slaves are at kind of the bottom of the chain where they are purely instrumental in their ability to reason and that's why they are naturally better suited to be someone's means to an end. And you basically have a version of the same argument now being used to justify taxpayer funding of somebody's fancy form of entertainment. And we don't think of them as slaves because, you know, they're not bound to their jobs, but they are bound to pay uh, by means of taxes. And that makes it particularly galling, I think, that we are then conceiving to hear these uh, professors and their students who are basically ends in themselves, the rest of society needs to sacrifice for the sake of their fancy entertainment. Uh, and the the kind of not the kind of sliver of truth that there is in this justification is that there is a diff there are there is a difference between theoretical and practical fields where theorists are more focused on, you know, determining first principles, and then the engineers are more uh, concerned with applying them. But it's not as though theorists shouldn't ever think about the implications of the principles that they're discovering or the applications of them. Uh, they need to be concerned with them. They need to think about, is this going to do some good someday, maybe not dis discovered by me, but by somebody else? Uh, or am I you know, digging a hole in the sand that is not really going to go anywhere? And I like to think here, for example, of someone like Albert Einstein, who's theoretical physicist, who makes important discoveries in that field, but who, when he realizes that the direction that physics is going in the 1930s is it's going to lead to the construction of a nuclear weapon, he sends a letter to President Roosevelt saying, this is going to happen. You need to be concerned about it. You need to make sure that the United States gets the bomb first. And uh, I'm coming <laughs> from Europe and coming to America to make sure I don't get, uh, uh, I'm not the victim of what they're doing with it in Europe. So it, theory matters for practice. Uh, and that includes theories about 
the value of the humanities. Um, and I think this last argument we want to look at will demonstrate that as well. And then this is the one that you started with, Sam. You, you mentioned that quotation from Agnes Callard from that recent New York Times article. And she's sort of the last one to talk about here because it, and there's a way in which we come full circle. Tell us more about her view. Yeah, I mean, this is the, this is the argument of I don't really have an argument um, because Callard wrote this article for the New York Times that actual headline of the article is I teach the humanities and I still don't know what their value is. And as you heard the quote at the beginning of the show, that that's an accurate headline of what, what she's saying and what she's admitting in this article. Um, so Khaled, as I mentioned earlier, she wrote this article for the New York times. She's also a, a she's a philosophy professor at the university of Chicago. So she's you know, very successful in the field of the humanities. She's working at one of the uh, pre most prestigious institutions in the United States. Um, she's also written a lot for a general audience. I mean, she's been very successful uh, in the field of the humanities. And yet she's writing this article to tell the world, to tell the whole readership of the, the New York Times, uh, yeah, I don't know what the value is of what I'm doing. I don't know why it's important, why, it's, why it matters, what value it provides. And just to illustrate this, I wanted to actually share a couple more quotes from the article. So I already shared the one at the beginning about uh, where she says, as a humanist, and explains a little bit about her experience, I am prepared to come out and admit that I do not know what the value of the humanities is. She then goes on to address some of this or mention some of the specific arguments we've talked about earlier. She says, I do not know whether the study of the humanities promotes democracy or improves your moral character, or enriches your leisure time, or improves your critical thinking skills, or increases your empathy. So her take on those arguments is, I have no idea whether they're, whether they're true or not. Um, and I don't, I don't know whether any of them, you know, work or whether the, whether the um, humanities have any of those values. Um, what, what does she have to say about the humanities and also about why why she doesn't think that it makes sense to, to give these arguments for them. Well, here's another quote. She says, the humanity, the, sorry, the humanistic spirit is fundamentally an inquisitive one. In contrast, defenses of the humanities are not and cannot be conducted in an inquisitive spirit because a defensive spirit is inimical to an inquisitive one. End of quote. Uh, so that's, uh, her, her argument is the humanities are by their nature inquisitive. Are uh, they asking questions concerned with raising questions, not with um, making defenses of themselves and staking out defensive postures. And then there's something contradictory about taking this inquisitive subject and trying to uh, make these arguments defending it. Um, finally, she says uh, uh, one, one more quote I wanted to read. I will admit that every time I hear of a classics department being cut, it hurts. I may not know why it is important to read Homer and Plato, but I do have a deep love for reading, teaching, and pondering those texts. That love is what I have to share with others, as well as the surprise and delight of finding that people thousands of years dead can be one's partners in inquiry. Right, that's the end of that quote. So th this is at least certainly candid. Uh, she's coming out and saying, I don't know. I don't know why what I'm doing is valuable. I don't know whether any of these benefits actually stem from it. Uh, I'm basically doing it because I love it. And I love, te I love these texts. I love teaching them. Um, but I don't, I don't know what the value is of doing it. Um, and I think she's... I, I suspect she's not alone and is probably far from alone among her colleagues. I mean, there are plenty of humanists who make the arguments that we've talked about above, um, uh, talked about previously, all these different ones from critical thinking, empathy, citizenship, etc. cetera. Um, I suspect a lot of people uh, recognize there's something that's missing the mark about those, and they don't really know why uh, their field is actually valuable. They don't really have a a clear view of it. And, and to the extent that that's true, to the extent that this is not just, you know, one stray professor, but that this is a view that's 
representative of something that's held by more people in the fields, um, I think that's that indicates a really uh, really deep problem, a really deep bankruptcy in the field. Um, I mean, you think about what what this means in, in terms of making a pitch to students as to why they should study the humanities or to, to taxpayers as to why they should fund them. It's you should spend tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, in the case of students, it's you should spend four years or, or longer uh, for this study or this form of study that I don't really know whether it does anything for you. I don't know whether there's any benefits for it. I know I personally love it, so maybe you would love it too. I mean, if that's the that's the extent of the argument, that's the level of the argument that you have for the humanities, um, it shouldn't be surprising that students are going elsewhere, that people involved in government are reconsidering their funding of these fields. Um, I mean, I think this is... Uh, this perspective is, you know, reveals that there's sort of a vacuum in the in uh, the way at least you know anyone who's who would agree with this. Uh, there's a sort of vacuum in the way that they view their own field, um, and it raises questions about you know, what they're what they're doing in terms of their their teaching and their studies as well. If, I mean, if you don't know what the value of your subject is, if you don't know what it achieves, what makes it useful and valuable, what what it accomplishes at its best. I mean, how do you know what you're doing? How do you know what you should teach or what you should study or how you should spend your time? Uh, it, it, I mean, it sounds like it really just comes down to, uh, well, here's something that I love. Here's something I'm passionate about. And hey, that that's, you know, that's good if it's something that there's good reason to be passionate about. But it sounds like uh, from what Callard is saying here, she doesn't know. She just, she feels something for it. But why does it matter why is it something that is worth spending time on? And if there's no answer to that, that's a real problem for a, for a field of study. It's worth, it's worth flagging, Sam, that we haven't cherry picked the worst possible defense of the humanities you could find by picking on this article. Uh, if anything, I, I regard Agnes Callard as, as one of the better philosophers out there today. She's, she's, clearly loves the subject. If you've ever seen her talk, she's got an infectious enthusiasm for it. She's very unconventional and unorthodox. She doesn't accept a lot of uh, of the kind of conventional woke uh, ideology that that uh, that you hear spouted in you know, various university classrooms these days. So this this is she's one of the better people. And yet even still, this is the best that she can do in defending the humanities. Uh, you asked, if you don't know what the value of your subject is, how do you know what to teach? And I suspect her answer is going to be, well, you don't really know what you're going to teach or how to teach it. You're, you should think of yourself as an inquirer who's inquiring jointly with the students. And there's a tradition of thinking about Socrates as a philosopher that often sees that as the role of the, of the teacher, not only in philosophy, but generally. Uh, and you know, there's a certain point to that, which is, as a teacher, you should you should be always learning and trying to learn from your students. Um, but it can't be the fundamental of how you think about this field. So, for example, she's I think she's right in her article when she talks about how uh, a lot of other defenses of the humanities see them as too instrumental and too politically instrumental. They see let's let's choose all of our subjects and our texts. Uh, in a way that is a means to the end of combating racism and sexism. So this is like the decolonizing the syllabus movement. Even if you're teaching history of ancient Greek philosophy, you need to make sure that there's a certain number of uh, uh, represented, unrepre unrepresented, underrepresented minorities who are uh, being uh, studied on the syllabus. So she's, I think, right to see, you know, you're, you're, you're cheapening the humanities if you are looking at them in that politically instrumental way. And she says, yeah, we need to even be willing to ask questions about why are racism and sexism so bad? And that's part of the inquiry process she's talking about. And I think she's right about that. But it's it's somewhat troubling if she doesn't think that the teachers of these disciplines can actually answer those questions, can actually offer an explanation that they think is true for why racism and sexism are bad or why uh 
Islamic totalitarianism is bad for that matter. Um, so this is, this is, you know, like there's an element of truth to the idea that teachers need to be learning themselves, but they still do need to see themselves as knowing more about their subject than their students. And you would think, especially knowing more about the value of their subject, if you want to get them to take the classes and just having an infectious personality and passion for the field isn't really sufficient because you could have demagogues who have uh, passion for whatever they want to do and en enthusiasm about that. And that is not, uh, that is not a, a valid reason to follow them. Uh, I, I also wanted to flag one last thing about her article that I found particularly annoying, um, though I often like her articles. Uh, she wrote, if at some point I am called on to defend the study of Homer or Descartes at some official hearing, I will do my best, but I do not deem it right to change my approach to what I study and teach in anticipation of that encounter. I will not run to battle. The battle will have to come to me. Well, I have news for Agnes Callard. You write a column for the New York Times. Uh, you've just written an article that brings the battle to you. And as you can see, you're already engaged in it with us. And so why would you write this article, have this platform, and not try to defend your discipline to the world in the course of doing it. That confession of ignorance, I think we can give her credit for, as you said, Sam, being candid. And I think in this regard, she is one of the more honest uh, members of this controversy or participants in this controversy. But uh, having admitted your ignorance, the question would then be, well, why are you using this form to confess it? Why not go back and spend some time thinking about the answer? Uh, it's especially important to be able to give that answer in a context where the, the question is, how do we justify the study of the field and how do we justify it, the funding of the field in a country where there's a lot of other people's money that's being spent to fund it? Can you justify the fact that probably many millions of dollars of tax money goes to pay your salary, even at a private institution like the University of Chicago? Most private institutions are mostly funded by federal student aid in one form or another. Can you justify that? Can you justify the fun that you're having uh, at other people's expense? Uh, and can you do it without appealing to something like Aristotle's pro-slavery ideas? So Sam, um, can we? Can we? <laughs> what what yeah. can we say in, in defense of the humanities and why they're valuable when and to whom? Yeah, uh, so I think it, what is true is uh, of what you were just saying about uh, what we were just pointing out in Callard's perspective that the humanities do, do deal with questions. Uh, there are questions that uh, are, we ask uh, and study in the humanities. But I think what's distinct about our perspective that you know, that we're uh, we're getting from Ayn Rand is that uh, the humanities are about studying the big questions in life uh, for the goal of living, for the purpose of living, for knowing how to live and, and having the, the perspective that makes, uh, makes it possible to understand what we should pursue in our life. So to live successfully, uh, we need to have a perspective on the world that we live in. What kind of reality do we live in? What are the, the, the laws of nature and things like that? Uh, what kind of beings are we as humans? What do we need? How do we function? How can we know things? And, and what goals should we pursue in our lives? What makes us successful? What makes us moral? Uh, what course of action should we pursue? What kind of life should we want to live? These are the kind of big questions that come up time and time again in the humanities and that they're really at their best uh, devoted to exploring. Um, a lot of these are these are questions that really fundamentally belong to the field of philosophy. Right? These are questions about the nature of reality, the nature of human beings, morality. Um, these are questions that come up in the field of philosophy. Um, and philosophy does uh, is the field that studies these questions and, and tries to provide um, abstract principles to guide us in in our lives and in thinking. Um, in, in response to these questions, uh, but it relates to all of the other humanities as well. And this is a perspective that Ayn Rand presents in her essay, For the New Intellectual. So she talks about how philosophy provides abstract principles that guide people's lives, 
and that these ideas sort of uh, provide a, provide principles that can guide a, a whole culture in how to you know, think about it, the world that they live in, think about how to live and what kind of political system to have and all sorts of uh, these, these really fundamental issues about, uh, about life and about survival. Um, but that, but she points out that intellectuals working in the fields of the humanities uh, work in a in a position where they transmit ideas from the abstract level of philosophy to ordinary people and to and to uh, and people in other fields to help them apply philosophical principles to understand their lives, the world that they live in, the culture, the events of the world. So this is what, you know, for example, history plays a role in this, that it's, it's history is giving you a uh, specific in, information about uh, things that have happened in the past, different societies that have existed, different people that have existed. Uh, but when it's working in, in concert with philosophy, uh, it can give you this perspective on what different ways of life have been operative at different times, what the results of those have been, and then how we can understand the issues that confront us in the present in light of the the principles of philosophy and the and the concretes that we've seen in history um the the humanities can also I, i'd add um provide concrete material uh that helps us to reach and think about and understand and test philosophical ideas um and i point to history for this i'd also point to literature um that these provide uh, concrete instances of human beings, human lives uh, that we can you know, look at and see, well, here's a person who tried to live this way. And what was the result? What happened? Um, and here's someone who tried to live a different way. And here's a society that was constructed on these principles, uh, had a government built on these principles. What happened? What was the result? And what about a different sort of principles? I point out that this is a, a, a view that is broader and deeper than the citizenship argument that we talked about earlier, because this isn't just about making the right decision in the voting booth or what candidate to contribute to. It's a perspective on your life and thinking about what kind of life do I want to live? What kind of life is best for me? And how do I understand the world that I live in? Um, this is something that all individuals need to have some perspective on in order to live a successful life. And so this is not just uh, how can we, you know, keep the government in decent working order. This is how can we keep each of our lives, uh, or not keep, but guide, direct each of our lives, build each of our lives to uh, be as you know, successful and, and wonderful as they can possibly be. Um, so that's, that's the kind of perspective that Ayn Rand presents about what value is of philosophy and how it relates to the other humanities. Um, and, and I point out a couple more things about this and then see what you think, Ben. Um, so one is that a, a big difference between this view and the one that Callard is putting forward about the fundamentally inquisitive nature of the humanities is that in our view, uh, the point of asking the questions, the big questions about life is to find answers and use those answers to guide our lives. It's not just to think about these questions uh, because they're interesting or because you know they help us think about uh, learn critical thinking skills as some of the other people we've we've talked about would say. No, it's about answering these questions so that we know what to do and how to live. Uh, so it's a it's a perspective that's really focused on what the value is of these questions to our actual lives. Um, and the other point that's worth pointing out is that um, this is a, 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 a reason why the humanities are important fields as, as such, important fields to have uh, present in our society, to, that it's important that some people are studying this, are trying to answer these questions, trying to analyze and interpret current events and concrete issues from the perspective of philosophy. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to take place in the context of a university of the type that we've we've seen. It could be done by a variety of other types of, of institutions. I mean, this is uh, this is something that you know you can have independent scholars doing. Even it's 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 something that um, 
it doesn't have to operate in a certain institutional framework. But I think as, as we'll talk about in a minute, I, I think it, universities can offer this. Um, it can be a value of universities, but it's not really a value that our universities are offering today. Yes, and Sam, I think the point you make about questions versus answers is is really the most important one there, that you can justify the humanities by the questions that they answer, but only because and if you think answers are possible. Uh, there's a kind of cliche that I've heard come out of different intro to philosophy classes, the way the different professors teach it by saying, if you don't have more questions by the end of this semester uh, than you had at the beginning, I've failed as a professor. And I'm in such profound disagreement with that view uh, because the point of having questions is to get answers, as you point out, Sam. And I think if, if we have fewer and fewer students signing up for these question classes, it might be because they think they're getting actual answers in the other fields. And that is the most honest motivation that students could have, that they're wasting their time uh, just getting more confused when in fact they could get knowledge from the STEM fields, for instance. I think people care about having knowledge. The best students do. They don't just want a fancy form of entertainment. And part of the reason for that is that they know that they need to answer these questions if they're to live their lives. These are questions that everybody has. They're especially questions that are important to a young person who's uh, forging a path in life for the first time and needs to make something of themselves. They need to decide what career they're going to pursue. They need to decide for whom they are pursuing that career. Should they be an effective altruist who goes out and makes lots of money just so they can give it away? Should they be a Mother Teresa type or should they pursue something that actually makes them happy because they enjoy that activity and it, 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 it enriches their lives? That itself is a big philosophical question that they need the answer to. College is usually the time when they are trying to answer these questions and humanities courses should help them answer these questions. Uh, when they don't have answers to these questions or when they're, the answers they get are the default answers that are uh, popular in academia, like woke egalitarianism, uh, we, we see the results. We see generations of people who are listless, have no real purpose, who then join a tribe for protection and are, you know, moved to the point of protesting on behalf of Hamas. So these are desperately crucial and important questions. They're not getting answers. And a good humanities education isn't just going to preach answers to them. It shouldn't just preach answers to them, but it should at least start to give them the tools for figuring out how they can get these answers for themselves. And when I was a university professor, uh, I would approach it from the perspective of what do students need to gain what I thought of as philosophical self-esteem. They need to be comfortable asking big questions, questions that challenge many of their basic premises, questions that many other people are maybe afraid to even ask. But then they need to understand, at least in principle, how these questions could be answered. That involves showing how philosophy and science and the STEM fields, for instance, are not these big rival fields, that there are overlaps between them, that there are actual scientific methodologies that you can use to try to answer philosophic questions, that, that philosophical questions uh, relate to the data of our of our observation that we can get from everyday life and that there's just a question then of learning how to conceptualize it in a scientific way and so uh these are these are methodologies unfortunately that are that are ignored by far too many scholars in the humanities and uh, too many of them have antipathy to science and see science as uh intimidating and threatening and don't want to try to make their 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 own field scientific in its own way but I don't think they should be intimidated like that and stop being defensive in the sense of thinking, no, uh, we have a inferiority complex and we need to try to make up for that. Um, I should also just add, as to the question of for whom are the humanities of value? Well, I mean, I think probably there are too many humanities majors, but as you emphasized, Sam, uh, the value of the humanities is completely independent from the value of humanities departments, humanities programs, humanities majors. Everybody needs art. 
I think we can agree. Not everybody has to take art classes to get the benefit of art. You can get the benefit of philosophy by studying philosophy on your own. Uh, you can get it by doing things like taking classes from the Ayn Rand University. Uh, but, and people I think are in one way or another getting what they need from philosophy from alternative sources today. Either they're, they're going to new alternative institutions like the Ayn Rand University, uh, or they're retreating uh, backwards to the sources in our culture that gave these answers in the past, especially, especially religion. But that's what you would expect to happen uh, if the product you're offering on a market is not actually meeting people's needs. And I think that's the fundamental reason why the humanities are in decline, why they are losing majors, because these departments are not trying to answer uh, the questions that students have, and they're not giving them, therefore, what they need. I think the root of that, and this would be a whole other episode to explore, is that the, the basic ideas that you see in the humanities today are anti-human and anti-intellectual. They, they have basically defaulted on, they've collapsed to the view that the mind is not efficacious, that it can't know anything, that it doesn't even have agency or free will over itself. I think you see that reflected in the views of Agnes Gallard, who's saying, I can't give you answers to these questions. I don't know that we can actually know answers to these questions. And just to wrap up, uh, I want to share a quotation from Ayn Rand from the, uh, for the New Intellectual, that same source that you uh, referenced a moment ago, uh, Sam. And uh, I think what she's saying here is a dramatic version of the point that I was just making. Uh, but it speaks to the, the bankruptcy of today's intellectuals and the consequences of it. She says, after decades of preaching that the hallmark of an intellectual consists of proclaiming the impotence of the intellect, these modern zombies are left aghast before the fact that they have succeeded, that they are impotent to ignite the lights of civilization, which they have extinguished, that they are impotent to halt the triumphant advance of the primordial brute whom they have released, that they have no answer to give to those voices out of the dark ages who gloat that reason and freedom have had their chance and have failed, and that the future, like the long night of the past, belongs once more to faith and force. Uh, when, when the intellectuals say the intellect can't answer our biggest questions, what is left uh, to defend fields that are intellectual? Why value the humanities if you can't explain what is our distinctive power as human beings, which is our ability to answer these questions? I think we should wrap up, uh, given our time. Um, I think we wanted to, to mention some resources that you might be interested in to learn more about our topic for today. Um, so we talked about the essay for the new intellectual uh, by Ayn Rand. This is really uh, a really valuable essay about the role of intellectuals in a society, about the role of the humanities, the role of philosophy. Um, so I very much recommend uh, reading or rereading that essay. Um, the Psychoepistemology of Art is another really interesting essay from Ayn Rand that focuses specifically on the, the arts, what role art plays in a human being's life. And that's relevant to our topic of the humanities since uh, some of the humanities focus on studying the arts. Um, also worth mentioning that we did a, uh, a new ideal episode just last week uh, about the ongoing a scandal about anti-Semitism on college campuses. Ilan Jurno and Ankar Gatte talked about the real scandal underlying campus anti-Semitism. Um, and at bit.ly slash under anti-Semitism, you can check out that episode and um, see what we had to say about that topic. I, I'd also like to let everyone know that we are starting a new uh, this podcast series that is focused on answering your questions about objectivist philosophy. We'll have episodes every month and we'll accept questions on an ongoing basis. Uh, so if you have any question about objectivism that you'd like to have us answered, uh, you can email us at a new specific email address for this podcast. That email is experts at einrand.org. So please send your questions there uh, and they may be featured in our Q and A podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast today, I'd like to remind you all again to please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Uh, you can click the bell 
to receive notifications when we go live or when we post new content. Um, if you're watching this on a recording, uh, please like, comment on, and or share the episode. It helps us attract new viewers, and we, we very much appreciate it. Also, of course, uh, please consider doing the same thing if you're watching on another platform such as Facebook. Um, finally, if you have any questions or comments about today's episode, or if you have ideas for, for topics you'd like to see us discuss in future episodes, you can always send us an email at newideal at aynrand.org. Uh, we read all of your emails and we reply to many of them. All right, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, and thanks Ben for discussing this topic with me. I, I thought it was really interesting. Thanks Sam, bye everybody.